This is a particularly hot area right now in our understanding of the definition of ACOS or asthma COPD overlap syndrome and many have said that there is no real case definition and that we're rehashing very similar things seen in asthma and COPD I would take a different tact in essence what I'm saying is that we have redefined this because there's an unmet need if patients were doing well then we wouldn't need a new definition but just as we learned from the NAEP guidelines in 1997 when we redefined asthma, a lot new came about. These patients with ACOS have never been studied. They're excluded from COPD patient studies as well as asthma studies. The overlap syndrome is a number of ways. Asthmatics can get there by having irreversible airflow obstruction. Now what causes the irreversible airflow obstruction is unclear. On the other hand, COPD patients can get there by having a reversible component of the disease and have a history of asthma. Typically what we're looking at is asthmatics who've smoked develop irreversible airflow obstruction. And in part, they're insensitive to inhale corticosteroids. We identified the problem, and then we recognized that typical therapies aren't gonna work. Potentially bronchodilators, both long-acting muscarinic antagonists as well as long-acting beta agonists are probably the cornerstone in the management with inhaled corticosteroids be used, to be used in some, but not all. What we recognize is using inhaled corticosteroids at high dose or oral steroids uh, induces a lot of AEs or adverse effects with little benefit. So I think what we need to do is understand the population, realize that some of these, if not the majority, are driven by neutrophils. Neutrophils are insensitive to steroids. So maybe we need to take different tacks, diminish our use of steroids and look at neutrophil drugs. It's actually relatively common, surprisingly, that in the European literature, about 30% of COPD patients may manifest asthma-like symptoms and have a T2 or TH2 inflammatory response. On the asthma side, about 15% of patients develop irreversible airflow obstruction. So to answer your question directly, probably somewhere between 15 and 30%. Not really. So I think many of uh, the pulmonologists and my colleagues would not do peripheral eosinophil counts. And recognizing that some COPD patients will have eosinophils in the periphery should jog the memory that indeed these patients may be an overlap syndrome. If, it, if the patient had, had asthma at the age of two and smoked and has significant history of cigarette smoke, that's a person who could be transitioning into ACOS or irreversible airflow obstruction. Usually they don't come to see a physician until they're already with the diagnosis. Patients, uh, this is a new sort of case definition and it offers great opportunity as we hone both specialties in recognition of the problem. Coming together offers an opportunity to recognize that there's a unique cohort and that our therapy should be tailored in a precise manner to the individual patient. I think there's more review articles being written than primary literature, but I can tell you in the last year, probably about 10 or 15 papers have now focused, that is research papers on this entity, trying to characterize the transcriptomic and genomic signatures so that we could utilize new biomarkers to identify the patients. And I think what you're gonna see moving forward in the next 12 to 24 months is a lot more in this space. Research, exciting insights into who these patients are and how these patients may respond to our current therapies. I think the recognition of the asthmatic who smokes should trigger the thought process that this is a different disease. This is not simply asthma and it's not simply COPD. I think maximum bronchodilation and the newest therapies using combined LAMBA, long-acting muscarinic antagonists as, long as, as well as long-acting bronchodilators might be the first stop. 
and then adding ICS or inhaled corticosteroids to that rather than ICS lava in everyone. So I think that that is really the takeaway, the takeaway that these patients probably have an atopic history. Many of them have allergic rhinitis, like asthmatics. So I think the primary care physician needs to be aware of the condition. And then I think sending it to physicians who are tuned to the latest therapies in ACOS would be helpful. I think often it'll come to bear when the patients have symptoms. If they're dysmic, if they're short of breath with walking or going upstairs, then they're clearly going to seek help. I think the question as to whether we can actually identify that them. there's smoking, that they haven't responded to conventional therapy, and that should trigger the measurement of eosinophils in the blood, maybe the fractional uh, exhalation of NO, other metrics to characterize the patient fully. The data clearly suggests, the most recent data, that if you have ACOS, you will cost more to manage than an asthma patient. And curiously, if you have ACOS, you cost more than a COPD patient. So in both angles, ACOS is costing more to manage. Well, I think at that point is the recognition of the problem and again, getting back on the right therapy and an awareness that this actually exists. I think everything is a five to ten year process. I would say five years there's going to be a fair amount of new literature and more importantly pharma, uh, big pharma and pharmaceutical companies will now embrace the concept in hopes of doing trials so that they could get an indication to treat specifically this group of patients.